Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's ADL webinar on solving the social dilemma and stopping hate for profit. My name is Kendall Kosai, and I am the interim regional director for the ADL Pacific Northwest, and I'm pleased to present this webinar with the ADL Santa Barbara Tri-Counties region on behalf of ADL's Western Division. We're excited for a robust conversation today, which seemingly is as more relevant than ever after last week's events. I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Dan Meisel, who will serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Dan was initially a litigation attorney in San Francisco, where his work included representing media clients in First Amendment matters. He left the law to write and film, pr produce films, including the feature film Benavides Born, which premiered at Sundance and was released theatrically under the title All She Can. After serving in many local and national volunteer leadership roles for ADL, including chair of its National Task Force on Education Equity, Dan joined ADL staff as Regional Director of ADL's Santa Barbara Tri-Counties Region. Take it away, Dan. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you for the introduction, Kendall, uh, and for your work planning this webinar. Kendall and I both had the idea for this webinar uh, around the same time without knowing it uh, towards the end of summer. And we finally connected and had the pleasure of working together to get here. As Kendall noted, the issues we'll be discussing were prominent before the assault on the Capitol last week, but they're now certainly front and center regarding their possible role in the long lead up to perhaps the most predictable extremist attack in modern US history and a domestic terror threat that appears likely to continue well into the next administration. So given the importance of these issues, I'm very pleased to introduce such informed panelists today. Our first panelist, Jeff Orlowski, was the director, producer, and cinematographer of the award-winning films Chasing Coral and Chasing Ice. Chasing Coral received the US Documentary Audience Award at Sundance in 2017. Chasing Ice received the Documentary Cinematography Award at Sundance in 2012, and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. Both films were shortlisted for an Academy Award for Best Documentary, screened at Congress and the United Nations, and have garnered awards and accolades from film festivals across the globe. Jeff founded Exposure Labs, a production company dedicated to impact through film. His latest film, The Social Dilemma, had its world premiere at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival, arrived on Netflix last fall, and has received widespread acclaim. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Thank you. Also joining us is Brenda Victoria Castillo, an activist, feminist, national strategic leader, and renowned speaker in the areas of diversity and inclusion, hate speech, media, civil rights, and social justice. She's an expert in alliance building, authentic storytelling, Latinx in entertainment, and women's issues. She currently serves as the first female president and CEO of the National Hispanic Media Coalition which is itself a coalition partner with ADL and several of seven other organizations leading the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. NHMC is a 35-year-old civil rights nonprofit organization that educates and increases visibility of Latinx from their work, excuse me, from their policy work in Washington, DC to their media advocacy in Hollywood, where they collaborate, create, and connect Latinx talent with the entertainment industry. Thank you for being with us as well, Brenda. Thank you, Dan, and thank ADL for putting this together. I should note that this webinar is being recorded uh, and that I've tried to incorporate many of the questions that viewers sent in advance uh, into my own questions. You'll be able to submit questions to the panelists through the Q&A function. Uh, we'll save some time at the end to consider some of those questions, but we'll plan on ending within an hour. So particularly for the benefit of those who haven't, for those who haven't seen the film, I'd like to start with Jeff to set a bit of the tech landscape for our conversation. Uh, Jeff, you, you started the film uh, in an amusing way that I don't think I've seen before in a documentary uh, by introducing a kind of who's who of uh, former platform uh, technicians or creators or executives. Mm -hmm. And then before their seat was warm, you asked them, so what's the problem? Yeah. And they were speechless. Uh, they had a lot to say, but they didn't know where to start. Right. Right. So it seems like you settled in on an answer to that question right before your, your opening credits with a quote from Facebook's former VP of growth, who said, I think the tools that have been created today are starting to erode the social fabric of how society works. 
Yeah. So I'd like to unpack that. Yeah. Uh, whose tools and what are the tools that we're focused on? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love to, um, once again, just thank you, uh, Dan. Thank you, Brenda, for being here. Um, uh, thank you to the ADL for, for holding the space for this time. Um, to kick things off, uh, we started making the cylinder in 2017 at a time where, you know, I, I went to college at Stanford and my friends ended up working in, in tech. And I think that's honestly how I got into this film and into the story in the first place was the, the friends that were, we all loved tech. I wanted to work in tech myself. Um, and in 2017, when we started making this film, there was a big curiosity in my mind around like, wait a second, what is this critique? Like some people are starting to criticize social media. Like I love social media, I use it all the time, what's wrong with it? And I think we went into those, uh, those interviews that we did that, that opened the film, those were shot in 2018. And there was such a genuine question in my mind and I think society's mind at the time, like, is there something wrong? What exactly is it doing? Why is it a problem? Why is it bad? Um, that's, that was 100% my mindset going into it at the time. Um, and over the last couple of years, it's been this massive education for myself and the whole team around what technology is doing at scale, how technology, um, one of our subjects references it as a climate change of culture, that the technology that a handful of engineers in Silicon Valley have created, most of whom this, they acknowledge, mostly white young men working in the Silicon Valley tech companies, have created tools now, I'm putting tools in air quotes, but they've created platforms and services that now have expanded 3.6 billion people connected on social media. Um, it is shaping the way humanity lives our lives, the way people think, the way people see the world, what people understand to be true about the world. And that I think is what we're seeing in countless areas in our society, whether it's our inability to take action on climate change, whether it's the increasing rates of hate speech happening online in countless different ways, whether it's the events that we saw happen last week. Um, our subjects tied it all back to this one core um, cause in how the technology was designed. And so which, which platforms uh, are we generally talking about? I mean, there are many platforms yeah. that use it, but which, which should, are worth focusing yeah. on for today's the ones, meeting? And there are, this is where there are many different um, arguments within the tech industry, different critiques at different companies. Um, there is a surveillance capitalism critique that, that looks at all of the companies that have turned us into raw resources for extraction. Right, just let that, that settle in for a second, where we, humanity, are the raw resource being extracted for the financial profits of these tech companies. Within that are the companies that I think we've been really focusing on, the ones that have been affecting the information ecosystem, the way we see and understand ourselves and our place in the world and what is truth. So all the social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, um, TikTok fits that, but Google itself and YouTube, um, those fit that category as well. They are changing the way we see and understand the world. YouTube in a really, really powerful way. Google in somewhat a more subtle way. And just one really quick example there. You know, the three of us here, we can search the same term on Google and based on where we are in the country, based on who we are, based on our past ha patterns, based on whatever Google thinks about us, it might give us different results for that search term based on what it thinks we want. And if I get a result for climate change that's different than the result you get for climate change, or fill in the blank any issue that we're talking about, it is a fracturing of truth at scale, fun fundamentally, across the entire population connected to the internet. That, that's what we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with like individual personalized information streams um, for all of us. I know, you know, when, uh user groups started first talking about the problems of social media. There was concern about what happens to our data? Uh, is our data shared? But that's not really the issue here. It's not really about the data. It's about something else. Uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about the, uh, what the real problem is. Well, I think it, uh, what's, the, what, what's the real problem? I, I'm going to be stumbling to define like the core. I mean, the, the real deep down problem is that we have financial interests driving our news and information platforms right now. Right, the, the business model that drives social media, it's also the business model that drives cable television, uh, just slower on cable TV than it is on, on social media. But these, these platforms that we all engage with, um, they're not designed with the public interest at heart. And I think that's one of the, the big challenges that we're facing, that we're, we're interacting with technology that wasn't designed for this level of scale and influence and, and um, impact on society. I recall, I think it was Jaron Lanier who said that the 
uh, you know, the concern or the product is not the people, the users, it's the ability to change user behavior uh, that these platforms are using and then monetizing uh, in a way. And if it, so, so as we think about the platforms who might have first come on the scene as kind of a, a public square or a whiteboard, um, how is what they're different, you know, how is what they're doing different than just a, a mere platform for the speech? Uh, how do these algorithms affect the way that, that uh, speech is amplified or, or connected between users? Um, yeah, this is, uh, I feel like we're jumping right in. I, I really want to get Brenda into the conversation. We will. And, we will. Uh, and, yeah. Brenda, what are your thoughts? Yeah, let me backtrack just yeah, a little please. bit. I yeah. think um, one of the main issues is when these companies were formed, um, they were formed with white males, engineers, scientists, never thinking to what it was going to become and how powerful it was going to be. And they did not include sociologists, psychologists, and quite frankly, people of color. They did not include their customers. And that's a shame. And I think that's why we are at where we're at. And as of today, I mean, I haven't done uh, to my total research, but I am almost certain that their board does not reflect America. So I think they need diversity and inclusion in all these companies. Thank you, Brenda. And, and you, you were seeing this across the media landscape before social media came along. How are you seeing it, uh, it play out differently within the social, social media context? Well, we've been at this for 35 years um, to eliminate hate, discrimination, and racism towards the Latinx and other marginalized communities. You know, we focus on media because it is one of the most powerful institutions that influence people's thoughts, behaviors, and quite frankly, judgments of others. So when we use the word media, we mean all media, and that includes social media networks because they are housing content, some of which is hateful content. Uh, we've been very progressive, and one of the, we were one of the first Latinx organizations to be in this space, and, because we knew in the regular media, if there was discrimination in new media, obviously there was also gonna be discrimination. Um, I have to say, today's ammunition for white supremacists, for white nationalists, for extremists, for domestic terrorists, are hate words. And hate speech can turn into hateful actions and crimes. That vehicle, the vehicle that they're using for hate speech is through social media and video, video platform networks like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit. Um, if we wanna get into it, I, I, may I? Yes, yes, you may. Uh, so um, some of the big alarm bells in 2016, when Donald Trump was running for office, he stated that Mexicans were criminals and rapists. These hateful words were repeated over and over again. He actually took out 2000 ads on Facebook referring to the immigrant invasion. That was in 2016. According to this past December's FBI report, anti-Hispanic hate crimes rose 9% from 2018 to 2019. All of this hate led to the most deadly attack on Latinx in modern American history that took place August of 2019 in El Paso, Texas at a Walmart where a white supremacist drove more than 600 miles and massacred people, 23 dead, 23 injured. This is what you call domestic terrorism, Trump's been spilling this hate for years, and these are the results. I have to tell you, it's no surprise to us what took place last week. This is a gigantic alarm for all of us. Um, as the documentary points out, social media platforms have created, created a wider vision, a wider division between ethnicities, between race, between Republicans and Democrats. And the largest alarm bell that took place is just last week on January the 6th on the United States Capitol in the coup attempt by domestic terrorists led by the President of the United States. And we shouldn't be surprised because we allowed him for more than five years to spill hate messages, rhetoric, conspiracy theories, lies, deception. And this is what manifested. 
Trump's false claims that the election was stolen without any evidence to support this unreality and told his supporters to take the country back. Again, online hate speech by Trump led to the violence and death. And today we all know that he, they're voting to impeach him. So before we get to talking, well, let, me, let me frame a little bit kind of for those that may not understand how the algorithm, how the algorithms work. I just want to back up a little bit to the technology and you know usually in response to the kinds of incidents and content that Brenda's uh, mentioning is we would say okay you need you need communal condemnation of the conduct and you need some kind of meaningful engagement to uh, to correct disinformation and to educate people about the impact of their of their conduct the social media platforms don't do that uh, in fact they seem to do a little bit of the opposite um, so Jeff could you just clarify yeah. kind of how the algorithms work to do the opposite yeah, we'd what we, how we'd hope to respond yeah I think there are a couple there are a couple points here to to bring up that the piggyback exactly on what Brenda was just speaking to um, you know I think um, the platforms like to think of themselves as a public square but if you think about a public square okay we get 500 people or however many people to stand in the square together and listen to each other and we all hear each other we actually all hear the same story that is not at all what's happening on social media right each and every one of us has our own personalized story unique to each and every one of us um i just put an opt ed together uh, with an analogy to the truman show which uh, we share in the film as well truman's living in his own bubble thinking that it's a representation of reality when he doesn't even realize that it's a completely fabricated reality that he's living in right that is each and every one of us on social media the algorithms if you feed it something it will reflect back at you what you fed it um, and this is uh, not some accidental thing. This is how the algorithms are designed and how they've been built out and the intention of the algorithms based on their business model, right? So the, the way the platforms work, because they're, found, they're financed through advertising, they have an incentive to keep you on the platform. They have a, an incentive for your time and your attention. Really, the, the, the currency is volume. Right? These platforms need to get you to see as much as possible. The more volume goes through the system, the more data they collect about you, the more they're better able to reverse engineer who you are. I know what to show Dan because I know I've reversed engineered Dan's mind and I know what exactly what's gonna keep Dan on longer and longer and longer. And likewise, I know what Brenda's gonna stick to and what, what Brenda's gonna keep looking at and keep Brenda scrolling so that I can squeeze in another ad, another ad, another ad, another ad. That's the entire business model. So this has nothing to do with truth. Right? It has nothing to do with values. It has nothing to do with what we as a society believe is good and proper, what we want to elevate, what we want to demote. It just has to do with how the, the platforms were designed around this incentive. And Facebook and others have countlessly said, oh, but we've tweaked this and we've tweaked that. The fact of the matter is like nobody has access to the algorithm. We, there is no third party review. We can't confirm, yet we can study the outputs that we've seen from the algorithms. So there's been research out of MIT that has shown us that lies spread six times faster than the truth on Twitter. So if you just step back and look at Twitter, let's operate Twitter for a decade in the United States, this domino going down the lies path, that domino going down the truth path, and where do the lies end up after a decade plus, right? This is, this is all compound interest too, right? The, the more you spend, the more time you spend, the more you evolve your thinking, it, it grows and grows and grows. And that is in my mind, as Brenda was talking to the polarization that we talk about in the film, this gap that seems to be ever, ever widening is at its core, from my perspective, at its core is a function of the way the technology has been designed. It's not designed to bring us together. It's not designed to build consensus. It's not designed to build bridges. It's not designed to help you to empathize with somebody that you might disagree with politically or ideologically, right? It is fundamentally designed to turn you into money and to reverse engineer to figure out what's gonna to stick to you. Now, just one last thought to add there. Um, these algorithms operate that same way across all of society. So if you're politically oriented on Twitter or YouTube, you'll get that shared back to you. Maybe you're interested in sports and you get algorithms on sports. I don't know if that is really ripping apart the fabric of society, right? But, but there are certain areas of the information ecosystem like politics and then also uh, around the conversation of teen mental health, 
where we're seeing really, really big rises in teen mental health. Once again, not a separate problem. This comes back to the same exact core design of these companies uh, and what young kids and children are vulnerable to at that stage in their life. So this is something that affects all of us. If you're not on social media, it affects you. If you're not on social media, if you don't use it, it affected the world last week in Washington. It affected us with the election. It affected us. It affects us all and not just in the United States, all around the planet. Um, and that's, that's really at its fundamental core, it's how the technology is designed. Uh, and before we talk about solutions, possible solutions for the technology, uh, I just wanted to jump to one kind of obvious heart of the problem, which is the content and the, the, the attitudes that people bring to the technology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so Brenda, I thought you know, maybe it makes sense to start there to talk about kind of methods of countering what's brought. Uh, and, and there seems to be a combination of problems, both the attitudes and then the technology and its amplification of it. Well, I don't believe that children are born with hate. Somehow they're taught hate, whether it's through their parents, their environment, and now we can add social media to that, unfortunately. So I think as individuals, um, we have a responsibility to receive our news from dis different sources. And unfortunately, people are just so addicted to social media that they're using that as their news source. So I think that has a lot to do with um, people's attitudes and judgment towards others. I remember when the Black Lives Matter protests began, um, different news sources and social media portrayed them not voicing their opinion, but almost being rioters and you know a mob. And then you see what took place at the Capitol last week and if those were black people, brown people, darker skinned people, they would have been shot and questions asked later. So I don't believe that people are born with hate. I think we are taught that in America and we have to know our true history and we need to get educate our children and start young. And this is one of the problems with, with social media. I think hate and racism I mean, they've, they've always existed in societies, right? But they've always been ideally sort of on the fringe, like you want that to be as fringe as possible and not exist, right? Yet, yet um, these social media platforms have turned the fringe into the mainstream where people who have hateful ideologies find other people like that and it gets reinforced and the content gets reinforced and you see more and more of it. So it reinforces a worldview. So if you, if you take algorithms and you apply it into a racist society with a racist history, we're just gonna get more and more like exponential racism. Like it's a fundamental, huge, huge problem that we're dealing with when you apply the algorithms to, to, to our country. And I think, and just to add to that, I think it's just so easy to spread this hate because it's a click of the button. Yeah. You know, before that, um, somebody would uh, pick up the phone and call that other person. Did you hear this? You know, and then they would have had a discussion. But there's yeah. not, to, there's no discussion. And if it is, you know, it's opposite ends, it's hateful, and but it's the click of the button. Um, social media companies have policies also that are in place. But it's one thing to have a policy and another one to enforce that policy. And I think that has a lot to do with it too, because many times the disinformation and hate stays on longer than it should because the platforms are slow to take it down. Um, and I'll give you an example. NHMC, we wrote a letter to Facebook in November, which focused on the Spanish language content featuring um, call to arms prior to the Kenosha shooting. Um, this, everyone knows that it was an event page on Facebook. Finally, Facebook took it down. And yet the Spanish language of the same exact content stayed up. And when our letter uh, was sent on November 16th, that content in Spanish was still up. And when we had the conversation with them, they, had any, they didn't have any excuse for it. I mean, if it's, in English, and it breaks their policy, why wouldn't it break their policy if it was in Spanish? I call that discrimination. 
And, and this is something that happens in a lot of countries where Facebook or Twitter or, or whatever company, they don't have local staff that, and this, this has been the case for a long time. I think they've been working on that, but for a long time, they, they had countries where they barely had any staff that, that spoke the local language. So there's no way for the content moderators to even understand the context of what's being shared and if it's hateful or not. It's, it's a massive problem. And Facebook will say it has over a billion users. So that's a lot of content for it to monitor. So I guess, you know, one issue, um, I'm wondering if the subjects in the film uh, addressed either during the film or outside of the context is what, what's the practical ability of the platforms to, to really have effective monitoring. Uh, yeah. And then the second question is, now we're, we're relying on the platform staff to determine kind of that border between what's free speech and what turns into more problematic content that is a violation of their guidelines. But tell me about the, that discussion. Yeah, huge, huge ethical questions in what you're raising there. Um, I think the, the first reflection is, you know, Facebook's motto was move fast and break things and they did move fast and they have broken a lot of things and they need to like completely flip that. We need to move slowly, we need to fix things, we need to repair things. You know, Facebook grew to that size um, there are over 2.7 billion users of Facebook right now, more if you add, um, you know, Instagram and, and WhatsApp, uh, their, their products. Um, but if they're going to get to be that big, they have to do that responsibly, right? That's the first minimum that they have a responsibility for the content that, they're, that, that exists on their platforms. They have all the legal benefits of being a publisher without any of the responsibilities of being a publisher. And they've just for years now said, not our fault, we're not the ones making the content. This is where, I mean, if we talk about solutions, the law needs to change. We need to change the law around this. Um, and there are practical ways we can do that. Um, there's reform that can happen to do that. Uh, that's something that is like, top, like should be the top of the list of the Biden administration in my mind is how do we regulate this? Um, and it's not, the, the government in my mind does not need to, uh, there's no first amendment um, conflict here, right? This is not a first amendment issue in my mind. Um, we have, rules around broadcasting that apply to television and radio and rules that if you're going to broadcast out to a, the, a large public, there are guidelines that you have to adhere to. None of those apply to the internet. Like those rules that the FCC has written out for all other broadcast mediums don't exist for the broadcast medium of the internet, right? There, there's so much that can and needs to be done um, that, that really are sort of fundamental first step things that we need to do. I know that's a question of, uh, of our viewers. We'll come back to that. You know, what, what can happen maybe in the first 100 days of a Biden administration? And, and we know that the law often lags technology. And so maybe we're in this catch up period. Um, but I wanted to go to Brenda and with the Stop Hate for Profit campaign that uh, emerged over the summer to talk about what kind of concrete things were the Stop Hate for Profit campaign requesting. Uh, and, and it wasn't a you know, ban these platforms, it was, it was a series of adjustments. And I wonder if you want to talk to uh, that list. Um, so we, NHFC really believes in coalition building. Um, there's strength in that. And Stop Pay for Profit launched in June, 2020. Um, Anti-Black racist speech was given a microphone instead of being taken off by Facebook. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories were rampant. Disinformation targeting the Latinx community was out of control. Coronavirus related to anti-Asian hate was at an all-time high, and Islamic phobia and other forms of identity-based hate were commonplace on Facebook. It was time to publicly call out Facebook and Stop Hate for Profit campaign was formed. Um, in July, we asked advertisers to pause their ads on Facebook for that month. And from the beginning, our goal was not to pierce the bottom line of their $70 billion company, but instead to raise awareness about the platform's willingness to put profit over people. There was around 1,200 businesses that paused their ads and 120 nonprofits joined the movement. Tens of thousands of individuals signed a petition. Um, in September, we had influencers and celebrities join the call for a one day freeze from posting on Instagram, as everybody knows Facebook also owns Instagram. They shared the coalition's messages across social media, and um, we were very appreciative of that. By December, the Federal Trade Commission and attorney generals from 48 states and districts filed antitrust lawsuits against Facebook. And additionally, 
some of the coalition members um, briefed the Tri Caucus. We work closely with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, the Congressional Asian Pacific and American Caucus, and the Black Caucus. Access to these services and privileges, one that Donald Trump clearly has forfeited. Um, if these platforms do not take out Donald Trump's accounts by the inauguration on January the 20th, Stop paid for profit uh, will start peacefully asking advertisers to stop advertising. So as Jeff pointed out, their reluctant, their, the reluctancy is because they're making a profit off of hate. So we feel we'll have to go after the advertisers to stop the advertising. Yeah. So the, the good news may be that five years ago, uh, the attitude of the platform seemed to be that they had no moral responsibility for, for the content. We seem to be past that. We seem to be around the corner and now we're talking, not in all cases, but in, in, in many cases or some cases of social platforms. Now, now the conversation is, okay, how do we do it? What do we do? Uh, Jeff, is it, is it as simple as um, removing the algorithms? Uh, is it, uh, you know, jumping into kind of the technical element, uh, how simple it is it to, to, to fix the problem? Uh, I don't know if we could possibly make it more complex than it already is. So it's a very, very complex problem in my mind, but there are solvable paths. Um, also, just to, to frame, um, I, I am, uh, I, I love technology. I love what technology has done in many cases, but not when it's bad technology, right? So I'm not, um, I'm not against algorithms. I'm against algorithms used poorly, right? Algorithms could be really, really beneficial for life and for humanity and for medicine and, and all different aspects of life. But right now, the world's best algorithmic engineers, the best machine learning engineers are at Facebook and Google and Twitter designing how do we keep you on the platform longer? It's like such a waste of brain power at the same time. Um, so uh, um, can you refresh me on the question? Because I, I took it down a different path. Well, I, I was just wondering if there were, you know, are there quick fixes? Of course, the code can be changed right away to stop the algorithms, um, which, which I guess in essence would tampen down the, yeah. the profit mechanism. Uh, the, uh, I, I just picked up my train of thought where I was yeah. going to go because um, these aren't quick fixes. I mean, the, the, the moves of the companies over the last uh, from many of the companies over the last week to remove or limit certain um, players uh, and certain voices that were queuing on conspiracy theories coming down, all of that. Um, it doesn't solve the fact that the misinformation has been out there for a long time already, right? So just take that into account because I, I look at these as polluted, toxic landscapes. I've stopped using all social media personally because I feel like if I use it, it's going to like, it's an attack on my brain and I wanna protect my brain from the misinformation and, and the, the, um, the way the algorithms will drive content for me. So I, I look at the landscape as being a polluted landscape in many ways. And if, if there's been toxic information that's been in this landscape for a decade now, it doesn't disappear if you look at 70,000 QAnon accounts and, and squash down on that this one particular week. The QAnon conspiracy theory has already been allowed to grow to the size and scale that it has because of these platforms. So there's a whole bunch of repair work that I think needs to happen from these companies just to, to get us back to, towards a shared truth and towards uh, you know, what's best for society. Did, you have any, did any of the um, interview subjects suggest a technological solution, kind of a redirect, uh, so that people looking for problematic content might be redirected uh, to less problematic content or to people that might be thinking differently than them? I, I, I've heard lots of different ideas and brainstorms around how the technology could be designed better. The problem and the challenge is that most of those opportunities and paths don't help the bottom line of Facebook and Twitter and Google. Right, the, the fundamental problem in my mind um, within those companies, the, the information kind of distortion companies, um, are, is that their business model, right? We, we talk about stop hate for profit because the profit is coming from the volume and the content um, of which of all that content, the, the hate speech is a percentage of all, they just want quantity of content going through their pipes. Right, so how do we shift the entire business model? Like this is one potential slice of a much larger pie of solutions, but we need to get these companies to have their business model be aligned with the public good. 
And let me, let me pose that same hypothetical from a different perspective, because imagine if you had social media that actually made you feel closer to your friends and family that made you feel a deeper, not just like, oh, I saw the photograph of what you had for lunch yesterday, like, like Zoom does, like FaceTime does, like it, it allows for a deeper, meaningful conversation between people, right? Imagine if social media did that with your closest friends and family. Imagine social media left you feeling much more informed about the news and not needing like a 24 seven, let me see what the latest thing is. What if social media allowed you to slow down, reflect, look at like comprehensive pieces, thoughtful pieces, right? These platforms have been shortening our attention span. We only get a, you know, 280 characters now. The, the idea of reading a 10 page, you know, special in the Sunday edition, it's hard to get through anymore because our brains have been trained to the short form thinking. So imagine if social media was something that you actually wanted to pay for that it provided value in your life. And yes, this is worth 10 bucks a, a month, just like my Netflix account, just my, like the Amazon account, just like the, the subscription accounts for, for the content that we get in different areas. Like I, I think a, a better world is possible, but it, it, it completely involves a fundamental shift and rewrite in the way the, the technology is designed. One of the, that's one of the great ironies that on, on one hand, you have this tremendous diversity using these platforms. So the diversity is present, it's just not interacting. Uh, you know, Brenda, is there, is there a, a kind of a vision of how social media could be working uh, to better suit the purposes of your organization and, and uh, the interaction you'd like to see? Well, first of all, I think that the CEOs and presidents of these companies need to stand up and be leaders. And they're not. They need to stand up and be leaders. They're Americans. And they need to put people first, human lives first and the democracy of the United States first. So nitpicking about the one strike, two strikes, I don't understand that. We are under attack by white supremacists. They have threatened other violent events that's gonna take place between now and the 20th. And they're giving um, Google, I think, I mean, uh, YouTube suspended Donald Trump for seven days. That's a slap in the hand. I don't get it if these extremists are out there, they just need to immediately be shut down, no question. So they have to stand up and be leaders. Another thing is that they need to empower permanent civil rights infrastructures, including C-suite level executives in these companies um, that can actually evaluate products and policies for discrimination, bias, and hate. And these positions must report to the CEO. I think Facebook came out that they hired somebody, but they're not reporting to the president and CEO. So that tells me Mark Zuckerberg is not taking this serious. Um, I think they have to have audits um, by outside companies that need to be made public. They should be published. Um, they really should ensure accuracy in political and voting matters, remove misinformation related to voting, and prohibit calls to violence, especially from our politicians. Um, basically, these companies need to add more resources. They need to add more human beings so that they can transfer one of the largest communication platforms into a human his into a force for good, as Jeff was explaining, giving an example. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, I agree. I agree. So I'd like to turn to a few of our viewer questions that came in. Uh, and I thought this was an interesting one. It was, what are some tools that can be implemented to assist students or supervisors of social media sites that students see for school purposes? You know, I know there's those kind of quick things of, okay, stop using social media, wait till you're a certain age to use social media, yeah. you know, take off your notifications. Um, but but uh, are there other resources that could help students? Yeah, we have some resources on our website, the social dilemma .com, uh, discussion guides and uh, some educational resources there. It is one of the things that we're wanting to really expand into this year because there's been such demand from from educators, from teachers, from parents and students. Um, so we really want to continue to build out a deeper curriculum for school purposes. Um, one of the things that we found as well, um, one of the big challenges that students feel is like it's hard for one person to get off social media because all their friends are on social media still. 
So there's like a massive FOMO component and just like missing out on things that your friends are doing. So one of the things that we've been suggesting, um, you kind of have to be in it together. Like have your friends watch the film together, have your families watch the film together, watch the film with your, with your children. Um, so you can have a shared conversation around, is this what you want your life to be like? Is this what you want your future to be like? What, you know, how are these platforms helping you and how might they be hurting you without you even realizing? Can you get your kids and their friends groups to collectively get off of the social media platforms? You can still engage digitally. You can still send messages via text or like there, there's still the ability to communicate with each other, but don't let it be puppeteered by Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok making you feel bad about the way you look, right? Like we're, we're training an entire generation of youth to literally believe that you are liked more if you change who you are. Right? Like modify your face and more people like you. That's being ingrained into a generation. Like that is so massively problematic for so many levels. But um, this is, and this is one of the challenges of, of, and why we framed it as the social dilemma, because it affects so many different aspects of life. But I think the students and the teachers, uh, it's something that we're wanting to do a lot more engagement with. So people can go to our website and, and get information there. And I also think at home, um, Dan, parents need to be having these raw, yeah. intimate conversations, because it does start at home. And they need to listen to their children and their concerns and understand why this is happening, because we can't create another generation, right? So we have the capacity right now to stop what's going on. Stop the hate. Mm -hmm. We must. And I'll note that ADL has some resources as well on its website, ADL.org, including some table talks uh, and lesson plans uh, that teachers can implement in the classroom about some of these issues and that parents can use to talk to kids around the dinner table about some of these issues. Okay. Brenda, uh, I think this question is a good question for you. To what extent do more mainstream, does the more mainstream media participate in perpetuating false narratives and perpetuating hate speech uh, by the way they report on it? Well, obviously, Fox is notorious for misinformation. I think they were calling the invaders patriarchs. So um, there's other companies that in broadcasting that um, we have to pressure also the FCC to keep them accountable. I think we mentioned the FCC earlier. So they're an independent agency that um, oversee broadcast licenses. And perhaps that might be a, a solution in the long run. Perhaps there needs to be an independent agency that oversees and regulates social media and video uh, platforms. Or uh, just to add to that, um, to, to oversee algorithms too. I, I feel like we need a, um, some sort of department of algorithmic justice, like, like to interrogate algorithms. Um, because it affects beyond the social media component. We, we know that algorithms can be racist. If you put racist data in, you get racist outputs affecting lots of different aspects of life and society, whether we're talking about credit card approvals, whether we're talking about mortgages, job um, algorithms, uh, hiring algorithms, um, recommendations for prison sentencing, all of these, um, these categories now have algorithms that are being applied to yield outputs that that in many cases are, are as racist as the data that goes into them. I, while you're talking about the algor algorithms, I, I wanted to point out that uh, in, in the film, you personify these algorithms by uh, an actor, Vincent Kartheiser, who um, many may have recognized as Pete Campbell from Mad Men era. Yeah. Uh, and so we did have a question about, are you, you must be drawing a direct line between kind of the manipulative advertising of the 50s and 60s uh, to now, is yeah. this the new manipulation? And did he I mean, personify it in that way? It, it absolutely, I mean, I was so thrilled that we got Vinny because it was so perfect for so many reasons in my mind. Uh, and he just did a stellar job with the role. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, these are manipulation platforms. They're driven by advertising. In many ways, uh, it is a critique on what advertising is doing. And, and in, in the tools were built at Facebook and Google and Twitter with the intent of providing 
an opportunity for an advertiser to find the audience that is really, really spiraled into this, um, the, the minutia with which manipulation and targeting can happen now, that now can be used for nefarious purposes. So you could have a well-intended mom and pop small business owner wanting to, you know, get their, their small local store in front of the community more, but at the same time, those same tools allow a foreign agent to add political manipulation into our country or any country at practically no cost, right? And so there's a, there's a huge, huge challenge in the way these platforms were designed and the way they're being, what we're seeing how they're being used in practice. So let's go back to section 230, because uh, we had a viewer ask about that as well. So this is the, uh, the federal law that basically immunizes the platforms from liability for disinformation on their sites. Uh, and, and so we have viewers wondering, is, two, two, is there a, a reasonable amendment to 230 if we eliminate 230 as President Trump has advocated for recently? What impact does that have on these platforms? Ironically, um, I think President Trump's desires for 230 would only hurt him all the more, <laughs> um, which is fine in my mind in terms of what, uh, what reform for 230 is needed. Um, and I do think we need reform on 230, right? As we were saying earlier, they have the privileges of being a publisher without the responsibilities of being a publisher. And they effectively serve that role. They are putting content out into the world at scale. Um, there's there's a, something that we learned in the making of the film because a lot of the engineers, they study psychology and how the mind works and how society works. Um, and there's a thing called the Dunbar number which hit me really hard. It's like, you can only really maintain relationships with about 150 people in your life. Like there's a physical capacity to like the depth of deep, meaningful relationships. Um, these platforms have given us the false sense that you can have thousands of friends, right? Most of the friends on these platforms, I don't really know them well or don't actually engage with them. And, and um, we're just connected through the platform. But I bring this up because um, as Tristan Harris says in the film, we've designed these technologies beyond human scale, beyond what humans can actually engage with and how we can actually connect. And this becomes a huge problem when we talk about broadcasting, right? If the average person, as, as Brenda was saying earlier, the average, you, you would call your friend. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? You see something, you, you talk about it with a small group of people, and that has been human scale for a long time. And now these platforms pour lighter fluid on everything, right? And everything just erupts into flames, whether it's good or bad or, or wherever it lands on, on a morality spectrum, the platforms don't even really care. They'll just pour lighter fluid on everything because that's good for the business. So I think there's a real challenge here around where do we draw the line on what is broadcasting? We've asked these questions in the past. Our government has wrestled with this in the past with publishing, with television, with radio. And we've gone through exercises where we had to put limits on what we consider acceptable for broadcasting or not. The entire internet industry has basically never been regulated and has gone this extremely long period of time with zero regulation and it's catching up to us. Like we are way overdue for saying, all right, we now see the opportunity and the pitfalls of this technology. And we need to figure out a balanced way, in my mind, that the government just puts up the guardrails for these are the rules for broadcasting. These are the rules if you're going to put something out that millions of people adhere to. And it's not censorship, and it also doesn't need to fall on the companies themselves. But we have a lot of the guidelines already done with the FCC in, in all the broadcasting principles. I've heard you make the point before about Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd yeah. There's, a, there's a really great example in that with a Saturday morning cartoon, you're not allowed to add a website, a URL at the end of the cartoon. It is illegal by the FCC to advertise in that fashion to young kids. However, YouTube, ki YouTube for Kids, like the, that platform designed for youth, is nothing other than URL after you after your URL, right? You, the autoplay just takes you to another link, to another place on the internet. So when you look at the differences between those two, we had really important enforced rules for this time when kid, we knew a lot of kids were watching cartoons every Saturday morning, and we put up guardrails for protecting the public interest. And we just threw that away on the internet, right? So I think in many ways, we have, we've learned these lessons 
and we can apply existing law to the internet. And that's a great starting point in countless ways. Um, and it also just says to the tech companies that you need to be regulated. Like antitrust in my mind is great as a first step just to say, look, we can flex these muscles again that we haven't used in a long time. And we can, we can enforce some rules around what is, what is safe within uh, the confines of our society. And I, I, it's just the first step in a, a long number of steps that we need to take. Yes, they need help. And I do feel they need to be regulated. Also, I feel that um, when new startup companies, I think they need to be evaluated and making sure that they're not um, startup companies run by Antifa, that their investors are not white supremacists, et cetera. It's a danger to, to our children. It's a danger to our lives. It's a danger to America. Um, do you guys remember when house part teenagers would have house parties? And at one point, children, maybe behind their parents' back or the parents left for the day, they drank and then they got into a car crash and some even fatal fatalities. Do you remember a change where now the parents could be sued because they provided the house, the home, maybe the liquor wasn't there, theirs, but they provided that home. That's how I look at it. These platforms are providing a home to spill hate that in the end result is violence, is death. And th that's just the way I see it. Yeah, and, and uh, a bar is responsible for exactly. somebody if they become, yep. right? There's law for that as well, yeah. yeah. Before the bar used to, even if the person was falling over their stool, they wanted to make a profit and they continued to give them their you know, shots or tequila right. or what, whatnot. Right. So that's true. They're responsible now. Mm -hmm. Brenda, I've often heard you say um, that how you're perceived in Hollywood is how you're treated. And could you tell us a little bit about the kind of historically how uh, Latinx population has been treated in Hollywood? Uh, and, and then are you seeing, is, is social media the new Hollywood? Well, we're definitely underrepresented. And I'm talking about all the way from the board of directors to C-suites. Um, the Latina in film is the most sexualized character, yet we purchased more than 24% of all film tickets. So we, oftentimes we feel they want our money, they want our market, but they don't want to give us the jobs, they don't want to portray us in a positive light. Um, and media is tied in to how we are treated, and that is why we have our children and other marginalized communities in cages. Our children are being um, silenced with drugs. They're being sexually abused. And then at the end of 2020, we found out some of the women were being sterilized without their permission. And that is happening right now with our tax dollars. And I, it, media does tie in to how we treat people. Trump kept on talking about the immigrant invasion and we're mistreating our immigrants. Do you feel with Trump being removed from these platforms, I know you mentioned it's not enough. Um, are we at a watershed moment, do you think? Is this kind of the big opportunity where things could change dramatically or are you not expecting that? I think it's slowing, slowing hate down, but hatred has existed in this country since the very beginning, since the colonizers. So they have just speed up that hate. I think that we have to really, it's time. This is a shakeup. This is a, a wake call. You know, Trump is leading domestic terrorists. They're leading, he is the leader and has, has unleashed and given the green light. And if we don't wake up and do something about it now, I'm afraid to what's going to transpire. I mean, there's still people that claim that the Holocaust did not actually exist. I'm so afraid right now for people's lives. Jeff, did you want to take an opportunity to provide some final thoughts on kind of where you, think, where you see things going? I imagine that your mind was kind of blowing up as you saw these events unfold last week um, and, and because your film had kind of foretold some, much of it. Uh, what are your thoughts moving forward? Uh, you know, I think we all, we're all carrying so much weight on our shoulders these days. Um, 
with the compounding effects of so many aspects of life right now. Um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, but I think the, the, the tide is turning on recognizing that we need these changes, we need this reform of, of certainly of the tech industry. Um, and while there's a, an uphill battle ahead of us, um, I am optimistic. Um, I'm optimistic because we need to fix these systems for the sake of democracy, for the sake of humanity, and more and more people get that. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not going to be simple and easy, but, um, but I'm, I'm confident we'll go down that path um, out of necessity. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, we cannot escape history. So I ask all social media and video networks, broadcasters and all media entities, how will you be written down in history? Will you be known? as standing by racists, white supremacists, extremists, and domestic terrorists? Or will you be known as standing by and protecting the democracy of the United States of America? That's all there is to it. It's the perfect note to end on. Uh, I wanna thank you both again, uh, Jeff and Brenda, for uh, joining us today for the important conversation. I wanna thank the viewers for submitting these questions uh, and joining the important conversation as well. You can find more information at stophateforprofit.org, uh, and you can also find many blogs uh, about extremist groups, uh, platforms, education resources, and relevant lesson plans on cyberbullying and other issues at ADL.org. Uh, and the ADL office nearest you also welcomes your call with questions. Let's continue the conversation uh, at another time. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.